World War I changed the dimensions of warfare in a manner that was just as dramatic and significant as the invention of gunpowder. The aircraft had been invented just a few years earlier, and a military application would naturally follow. The plane's importance from 1914 to 1918 has often been discussed with opinions very divided. But whichever argument applies, post-war military tacticians rarely doubted the importance of air superiority in any armed conflict. The Stuka, probably the most recognizable aircraft from the Second World War, played a pivotal role for the Luftwaffe in the early years of the war. It was considered by the German high command as flying artillery that could keep up with their fast-moving panzers. The Stuka was designed in 1934, and the first prototype flew the following year, and it had its combat baptism during the Spanish Civil War. Hermann Goering assigned three Stukas to the Condor Legion, the German expeditionary force that supported Franco during the Spanish Civil War, where the attack on the town of Guernica became notorious throughout the world, immortalized in Picasso's famous painting. The name Stuka is simply an abbreviation of the German for dive bomber, Sturzkampfflugzeug. Its official name was Junkers Ju-87, with a variety of suffixes. By 1939, the manufacturers had stepped up the production to 60 per month, and the Luftwaffe had 336 Ju-87B1 in service when war broke out. Though the Stuka continued being made throughout most of the war, and in total more than 4,000 were built, there were never more than 400 in service at any time. The Ju-87B was an improvement of the Condor Legion version. By 1939, the engine power had been increased from 680 horsepower to 1,200, and landing gear had been redesigned. Both Hitler and his propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels, understood the importance of the Stuka as a terror weapon and as a potential suitable propaganda tool. They were only too right, as the following months would prove.
When Hitler and his generals were planning Fall Weiss, Operation White, the attack on Poland during the summer of 1939, the Stuka was very much part of the strategy they intended to employ. When the German forces crossed the Polish border, they were ignoring an ultimatum posted by both France and England guaranteeing the sovereignty of Poland. However, there was no direct military intervention by the Allies at this stage, only political support. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here is a recorded message from the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Neville Chamberlain. I am speaking to you in the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, thinking that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. The declaration of war does not stop the German war machine. It is unstoppable. And this is the first time the world witnesses Blitzkrieg in all its devastating power. Poland can offer very little resistance, and despite some brave fighting, is completely overrun in less than six weeks. Though many aviators claimed the Stuka to be obsolete at the start of the Second World War, it was invaluable during this first campaign in Poland and scored a number of firsts. It dropped the first bomb of the war and was also the first plane to shoot down an enemy aircraft. The latter rather remarkable considering its general characteristics. There had originally been a fair amount of opposition to the Stuka, but their success in Spain had persuaded many, including Commander Wolfram von Richthofen. And that success was replicated during the Polish campaign on a vastly larger scale. The destruction of Poland was then achieved by the efficient cooperation between the fast-moving Panzer and the Stuka squadrons. And much of the credit for this must go to the Luftwaffe's director of armament, Ernest Udet, who introduced the dive bomber concept. Udet was delighted with this early success, and he became a rising star within the Nazi administration but later became disillusioned, became an alcoholic, and committed suicide. Hermann Goering, never one to miss a photo opportunity, personally decorated Army and Luftwaffe personnel after the Polish campaign. And there's little doubt that this would also become part of the continued German propaganda drive. 
Propaganda had been central to the National Socialists from even before they came to power in 1933. The Stukas could be used within the same vein as Burning of the Reichstag and the propaganda films of the day. The persecution of Jews, Aryan literature, Goebbels' personal clever and vitriolic broadcasts, and the display of military strength were all integral parts of a campaign aimed at convincing the German people of the virtues of the Nazi administration. The Stuka was, in many ways, an unlikely candidate for a propaganda role. Yes, it was an efficient and precise dive bomber, but it wasn't very fast, with a maximum speed of no more than 255 miles per hour at level flight, though its diving speed approached 400 miles an hour. It was armed with two forward firing machine guns and twin machine guns in the rear of the cockpit, and its maximum bomb load was 1,000 kilograms. But it had caught the imagination of friend and foe alike and did have many successes throughout the war. It was, no doubt, the sudden appearance and the howling noise emitted by the Stuka when diving that helped build its reputation. That was certainly the thinking of the Luftwaffe, as they fitted it with a special siren to enhance its threatening noise when approaching a target. The Stuka provoked a psychological effect in people. Because of the siren, people would stay in their shelters for hours and would not come out. We couldn't believe that the siren would have such a strong impact. The Stuka then achieved status, and volunteers were queuing up to join the Luftwaffe, and the pilots that were selected for the Stuka squadrons became matinee idols, often appearing on the cover of popular magazines. This was not the whole story. There were people with very different reasons for joining. Not everybody in Germany had fallen for the propaganda. You asked how we as young people related to National Socialism and war, but first of all, let me explain that I'm from a communist family. My father worked in Leipzig with Mayor Godelou, who was executed after the attempt on Hitler's life. My father was the foreman of the local Communist Party, so early on I had my reservations of National Socialism. I was never a member of the National Socialist Party or the Hitler Youth. I joined the Luftwaffe to escape, in a manner of speaking. The Luftwaffe was known for not being strictly National Socialistic. Wow. 
The success in Poland was not immediately followed by further expansions, but Hitler and his high command were planning their next moves, and the Stuka was also being prepared for further action with a number of improvements. Improved vision for rear gunner. Stronger engine. Redesigned landing gear. And enlarged fin and rudder. The invasion of Denmark and Norway did not cause the Germans many problems. Denmark was overrun within hours, and Norway fell after a couple of weeks. The Stuka still had work to do dealing with the British Navy, trying to come to the rescue of the Norwegians, and actually succeeding in landing a force in Narvik in the north of the country. The Stuka was ideally suited for this job, a slow-moving target with no air cover, only a few anti-aircraft guns as defence. Now, a new and more demanding front was to be opened. After months of low-key activities, the phony war, the Germans had amassed more than 40,000 armoured vehicles, ready for Felgeld, Operation Yellow, the attack on France. The lessons learnt in Poland were improved upon and implemented during this massive campaign against France, Belgium and Holland. Blitzkrieg. The use of overwhelming force where the enemy least expects it. This was most certainly Blitzkrieg. Supported by Stukas, the German panzer bypassed the Maginot Line and forced their way through the Ardennes in less than three days considered impossible by Allied military experts. The Germans had achieved air superiority, which didn't only give their dive bombers a free range, but allowed them to bring reinforcements up to the front by plane, enabling them to secure areas overrun by their panzers. The German advance in northern France was so fast that both fighter and Stuka squadrons flew from new airfields almost daily. Though their supply lines became very stretched, they still managed to bring sufficient bombs and fuel forward to keep their planes flying. While these Stuka pilots synchronise watchers for yet another sortie, the British expeditionary forces are being hailed by the local French population. But they are not to be the rescuers of France. The Allies are woefully ill-equipped compared to the Germans. They even have extended supply lines and are completely ignorant of the strategies employed by the enemy. Radio communication between Panzers and Stukas makes coordination of the use of either weapon swift and efficient, enabling the Germans to strike where the Allies are most vulnerable.
the Germans appear to be unstoppable, and the Stuka squadrons have the luxury to be able to select their target at will and almost strike at their leisure, with the chances of meeting serious opposition very slim. Targets for Stukas and conventional bombers had, so far, been military. But somebody with not too many scruples thought up an idea that would change that. The plan was to let conventional bombers bomb a town situated near to or on a main road. This action would then force the population out of their houses to the road in order to escape. A Stuka plane would then strafe the people, forcing them to move in a direction already chosen by the Germans. In the same manner, any side road would be closed to the refugees. The result was that a mass of people could be made to block a selected road and make passage for Allied troops at least slow and cumbersome, or at best, impossible. Maybe not particularly humanitarian, but very effective.
The British expeditionary forces situation in northern France was becoming impossible as they were running a risk of being trapped in a pincer movement as little or no opposition was facing the Germans to the north and to the south. Hermann Goering, still flushed with recent success, promises Hitler that his Luftwaffe will finish off the British, stressing that the Royal Navy won't pose a major problem for his aircraft. The Royal Navy's biggest concern was how to rescue the 270,000 men of the BEF and the 60,000 French troops now isolated on the beaches of Dunkirk. The main German forces were still some miles away and it was very much left to the Luftwaffe to try and prevent the evacuation. Eventually, more than 330,000 troops were taken off the Dunkirk beaches and returned to England. It was a massive effort involving the Royal Navy and scores of assorted ships and boats from fishing vessels to private yachts. With England in sight, Adolf Hitler signs Führer Directive 16, the preparation for a landing in England on the 16th of July. The Luftwaffe was to pave the way. Stukas launched an all-out attack on Allied shipping in the English Channel. This campaign proved so successful that the Royal Navy had to keep their destroyers in port during daylight hours. But however unlikely it might have appeared at the time, this was the Stuka's last big operational success on the Western Front. Hermann Goering believed that the Luftwaffe could, almost single-handed, defeat the British. His trust in the capabilities of the Stuka made him make a significant error of judgment. He decided to deploy this decidedly tactical weapon strategically, sending them against targets in England itself. British Fighter Command was being strengthened almost daily, receiving new Hurricanes and Spitfires and, most importantly, new pilots. Comparing the Stuka with its main opposition, the Hawker Hurricane and the Spitfire, may explain what was to follow. The Stuka's engine capacity was, as mentioned earlier, 1,200 brake horsepower. The Hurricane and the Spitfire were equipped, respectively, 
with 1,050 brake horsepower and 1,175 brake horsepower engines. But the weight difference was significant. The Stuka weighed in at 6,600 kilograms, whilst the Hurricane and the Spitfire both scaled less than 3,000 kilograms. The maximum speed of the Stuka was approximately 410 kilometers per hour. The Hurricane could exceed 520 kilometers per hour, whilst the current version of the Spitfire topped 575 kilometers per hour. The Stuka was armed with four 7.92 machine guns, the Hurricane with eight 0.303 caliber machine guns, as was the Spitfire. The superiority of the English fighter was such that a confrontation with Stukas soon was referred to as a Stuka party. Stuka commanders soon realized that they had to stay in close formation to have a chance of survival. The important thing was to keep formation. This way we could use the machine guns better. But then the English would pick one out of the pack and the pilots were quite scared because the Spitfire was fast. Um, we didn't, well I personally didn't come across Stukas until they did a raid on Dover one day. And it was a turkey shoot, literally, because uh, uh, by the by the time we'd got airborne, the attack had started on Dover, and there were these Stukas diving down. And of course, not very fast. They'd got dive bricks and so on and so forth. And um, all you had to do was get behind them, make sure you didn't overshoot them, um, and get in front. <laughs> so you had to shut the throttle at the bottom, and they'd got to pull out at the bottom. And there was a lovely plan view of an aeroplane, lay on deflection, bang, no trouble at all. And uh, so they were really fun to come across. Yes, we had a we had a big day on, on Dover. Where we clobbered quite a lot of them. Fighter command was kept busy keeping score of the kills, whilst ensuring that there were fighters available to meet each new attack. The fighters would generally attack the Stukas from above and behind, so communication between rear gunner and pilot was important if avoiding action had to be taken. But this was primitive. Of course we had to communicate and the noise was too loud to shout. So we used an etch-a-sketch pad to write what was going on, whatever it might be. A fighter coming from behind. You quickly wrote it down and passed it to the pilot who would write something to me and that way we could understand each other. With the odds stacked squarely against them, the Stukas suffered heavy losses during the summer of 1940, of planes and crews. I lost several good friends, but in the evening we would all sit together and have a glass of wine, and the next day we would go up and do the same again. The Stuka crews might have been willing to make the sacrifices, but the Stukas were withdrawn from this front. The respect for the Stuka by Allied pilots was now at an all-time low. The world often says that the Stuka was the finest dive bomber ever built. Well, in many ways it was. I agree where accuracy was concerned and so on. It was, uh, it was in a, a drawer of its own. 
However, what people forget is that when one Stuka took to the air, it had to take with it one Messerschmitt to look after it. When a Spitfire took to the air with two bombs on, a Spitfire is always a Spitfire, and it didn't have to take any fighter escort because it was its own fighter. Uh, so in that, that respect, I think the Spitfire did just as good a job as the Stuka ever did. When the Stuka was deployed in North Africa and in the Mediterranean in 1941-42, a few changes were made to suit the new environment. It was, amongst other things, given a new livery and sand filters were fitted. The main target for the Luftwaffe in the Mediterranean was again the Royal Navy. If Germany was to establish its superiority here, they had to prevent supplies and reinforcements reaching British bases. The Stukas that took to the air from airfields in Sicily and North Africa were now officially outmoded and were supposed to have been phased out in early 1941. But there wasn't any realistic replacement and they continued to be built throughout the war. The Allies did have some fighter cover, but not nearly enough, and the Stukas rarely had problems getting through to their targets, and they inflicted quite heavy casualties on the Allied naval vessels in the area. The Stuka delivered its bombs at the end of its characteristic almost vertical dive. The pilots had to be very fit. Indeed, they often passed out and had to rely on the automatic pull-out system installed. Yes, it was a tremendous stress on the body. You could, for example, not fly when you had a cold. When the aircraft was flying level, it was relatively slow, 230, 240. But when diving, the speed was tremendous. The face first stretches and then the body is compressed. The head would be all over the place. But the automatic pull-out did fail, and it was up to the pilot to function under this extreme stress on the body. Some pilots lost their concentration, and when they tried to pull their plane out of a dive, it was too late. But for all the trouble experienced by the pilots, the campaign in the Mediterranean is ultimately successful when the Stukas managed to cripple the Royal Navy's only available aircraft carrier. British naval domination in the Mediterranean is finally broken. The Germans had not only broken Allied naval domination, but had also achieved air superiority, allowing an unhindered reinforcement of Axis powers in North Africa by the airlift of the first units of Rommel's Africa Corps to Tripoli. Rommel was himself an admirer of the Stuka, of which he had 50 at his disposal at the beginning of his campaign in North Africa. Rommel's Stukas were not only deployed in the more traditional manner against Allied ground forces, transport columns, tanks and airfields, but were quite innovatively used to clear minefields in front of moving panzers.
The Stuka did so well in the desert that one of Rommel's generals stated, the British dread of the Stuka is equaled only by our soldiers' affection for them. Rommel's opposite number, Montgomery, was well aware of the threat of the German Stukas to his 7th Army, the Desert Rats, and realized that the German success in the air had to be curtailed. And the arrival of Hurricane and Spitfire squadrons in the North African theater helped to swing the balance in the Allies' favor. At the time, the Stukas had very little fighter support, and, as was the case over southern England, the German dive bomber was no real opposition to British fighter command. The Stuka squadron's next major operational theatres were Greece, Yugoslavia, and Sicily, areas of great strategical importance. Later, Stukas played an important role at Anzio, attacking Allied naval forces, a task that, as we've seen earlier, they were particularly suited for. Not all Stukas participating in the campaigns in the Balkans and later in the Soviet Union were operated by the Luftwaffe. Romanian, Hungarian and Bulgarian air forces were also equipped with the dive bomber. The JU-87B-2 was one of the first Stukas to see action on the Eastern Front and was mainly used to destroy earthbound Soviet aircraft. Again, a job it was ideally suited for. Having partially crippled the Soviet Air Force, the road was open to the German Panzer. This was a time when the German war machine appeared almost unstoppable. The Russian winter did hamper the Stukas, as it did the war effort in general, but they were kept flying throughout the initial German onslaught, attacking Soviet defense positions around Moscow and Leningrad. It was at Leningrad that the most celebrated Stuka pilot, Hans Ulrich Rudel, performed one of his most famous feats, when he single-handedly sank a battleship in the harbor diving at a speed never before achieved by a Stuka. It was an astonishing action, as he should have passed out both during the dive and during the pullout. He must have been an exceptionally fit man. When Soviet determination and the Russian winter were turning the tide, Goering's Luftwaffe came up with the Stuka tank buster, fitting the aircraft with a special 37 mm cannon designed to penetrate the Soviet armor. 
During Operation Citadel, the code name for the battle at Kursk, the biggest tank battle in history, the Stuka was deployed almost exclusively as an anti-tank weapon, and with a great deal of success. Rudel again excelled when he, in a single action, knocked out 12 Soviet T-34 tanks. We were not specialized in anti-tank duties. That was the task of the then Colonel Rudel. He had a 3.5 centimeter cannon specially made for panzer attack. And with that, he shot up a couple of hundred tanks. Hans Ulrich Rudel had indeed become a German hero, idolized by the party and the public alike. Hundreds of victories to his name and surviving being shot down more than 30 times. No wonder he became a myth. And Rudel was an idol for us young people. I can still remember clearly the day when Rudel came to tank up his plane and then he came into our tent. Our boss, an Oberleutnant, stood to attention and said that he would get him something to eat. After the Oberleutnant had left, Rudel turned to us and said, haven't you got anything? As he took the lid from a pot and had some tepid pea soup. He took my spoon and wiped it on his trouser bottom once. After he left, we thought that he was a real guy, a pal. Though not everybody had the same opinion. Rudel was, when we got him and brought him over here, he was wounded. Um, he had his left knee bound in a rather bloody bandage and he'd got crutches, he was arrogant, um, he had so many decorations that as uh, Bob Brown, our great night fighter race, said, if he fell in the sea he'd go straight to the bottom of the weight of <laughs> um, He said to us, um, give me a spitfire, and um, put your two finest fighter pilots at 2,000 feet over the airfield. I will take off, shoot them both down, and go home to Germany. That was his arrogance. And he was Stuka pilot. Whatever was the individual opinion of an individual pilot, the Stuka had made its indelible mark on the Second World War from the attack on Poland to the skies above northern France and Dunkirk, to North Africa and through to the Eastern Front. The Ju-87 became the legend that was never meant to be.